Welcome everyone to our second panel of the industry series today. Uh, we at the Canadian Film Fest would like to acknowledge that we are in Toronto and are meeting on the traditional territory of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we encourage our audience across Canada to learn about and acknowledge the territory that you are on. As artists and storytellers ourselves, we recognize that we work and create on a land where the voices of and stories of its indigenous inhabitants are continuously stolen and diminished. In that sense, we'd like to highlight the work of the Indigenous Screen Office and NSI and encourage you to support their work in uplifting indigenous voices. Welcome to CFF, presented by Super Channel, where Jen. I, I'm Jen. <laughs> and Alice <laughs> for CFF Industry. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm sure you're all super excited to hear from the Streams team and to watch Streams Flow from a River premiering on April 1st. The whole season will be dropping on Super Channel, so you can binge watch the whole thing. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're also very grateful for the support of a few of... Oh, Oh, I'm so uh, the distillery restaurants, which is a huge supporter. Uh, uh, we are grateful to them and want to make sure that you all go to the distillery and eat there. There's a lot of delicious things. Um, <laughs> the panel you're about to see is also co-presented with BIPOC TV and Film. They are a community-centric, non-profit movement advocating for racial equity and decent work practices in Canada's screen media industry. Yes. Moment for that. If you don't know them, please check them out. They provide career training, mentorship, job access, and support with mental wellness, anti-racism, and anti-discrimination workplace intervention for racialized and indigenous professionals working in Canada's screen media industry. Yeah, and a bit of housekeeping. Um, this panel will run until 3.15 with plenty of time for your questions uh, from the audience. So please hold your questions until the end. And if you need to pop out, free, feel free to do so quietly. And we also encourage you to turn your phones on silent uh, just so you're not disturbing folks. So without further ado, um, I will introduce you to this panel's moderator. We are so grateful to Kadon Douglas, who came to us with an idea for this panel, which officially opened the door for digital series on the CFF platform. Thank you, Kadon. With a reverence for artists, uh, coupled with a deep commitment to e equity and decolonization, Kaden finds her joy in supporting creative talent and building thriving careers. As the executive director of Toronto based nonprofit BIPOC TV and Film. She spends her days advocating for systems change in the screen media industry, addressing barriers to career entry and advancement for racialized and indigenous creatives and disrupting colonial and discriminatory practices for the nonprofit sector and creative industries. I'll stop talking, Kate, and it's yours. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, when I knew that um, the Canadian Film Fest was coming around, I also knew that this amazing project um, was coming out soon, and I thought, what better way to celebrate the evolution of Canadian content, um, especially in this time when we are working on redefining it with new people at the helm, with new voices finally being amplified, with new stories being told. What better way to do that than a group of young, vivacious, um, <laughs> resilient, <laughs> amazing filmmakers to do that with. And especially um, once we go into the panel, just talking about um, the groundbreaking way in which they've built out this series and what this is going to do for Canadian content going forward. Um, so I will start off with allowing each person to introduce themselves and by introduce your name and your role on the project. We'll, we'll get a chance to hear lots more about you afterwards. Plenty. <laughs> um, I'm Christopher Yip. I'm the creator, showrunner, and director of Stream Slow from River. Hi, everybody. My name is Alan Liu. I was the cinematographer on Streams. Hi, I'm Sean Joshi. I'm president of Fate Pictures and executive producer of Streams. Hi there. I'm Lauren Saramaki. I'm the co-producer of Streams, and I was also the production manager. Hello, uh, my name is Liam Ma, and I'm an actor. I played Henry Chow on streams. 
Hi, I'm Jane Luke. I'm also an actor, and I play Diana Chow. That's so sweet. We'll hear so much more from Jane soon. This was only like a little bit about how amazing she is already. Um, so before we go into this discussion, um, I just want to say like I watched streams. I woke up one morning um, before I got my day started and while I was undoing my hair, being very black girl magic, <laughs> um, and watch this film, and I am so deeply grateful that work like this exists in Canada, that a generation of filmmakers, of artists, um, of just people who generally live here and beyond it are going to get to see something like this on screen. Um, the first time I remember while I was watching it, several times I wanted to text Christopher with just like exclamation marks. Just be like, Christopher! Like that would have been the text to him. Um, but I didn't, didn't want to weird him out before 9 a.m. Um, but when I watched it, I really, what my feedback to him was, it felt like a really great piece of literature. Um, so I can't wait for the rest of you to see this film, to see yourselves through it. Um, but um, in the meantime, please take a look at the trailer for Streams Flow From A River. Henry, you have to come home. Ba had a stroke. Ah, Henry, I'm going to come home. The highways are closed, too much snow. You'll have to stay here. <coughs> My father. He so scares me. You stupid boy. Pa is sick. We need to keep the peace in this house. There's no peace in this house. You're just too much of a coward to leave. It's a miracle. We came from the other side of the world to the same country, same city. And now we're here. It feels like destiny, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. God is a father to the fatherless. He finds the lonely, those without a flock, and brings them into the fold. Because without families, we are lost. That line, without family, we are lost, is actually a line I wrote while I was watching the series um, that deeply resonated with me and also informs like a lot of the work that we do, just knowing that by nature we are relational people, um, but also just knowing what it means for us as immigrants, um, that family is usually our anchor in this space. Um, so, Gonna start there <laughs> with um, and Christopher. This is this is prestige drama. This is um, this is such a deeply emotional film, and it's also your debut as a showrunner. Um, so quickly, like, what? Why was this story chosen for your debut? That is a good question. I think. Um um, well, I'll talk about the, the very kind of like origins or the see this story. And I, I've, I've told this story before, but um, uh, I spent a few years away from home. And uh, while I was away from home, my, grandpa, my grandfather had a stroke. And I went uh, back home to Edmonton to see him. And uh, while I was there, I went to visit him with my dad, his son. Um, while I was at the elderly home where he was being taken care of, um, I saw that he was bedridden and he lost the ability to speak. Um, but when I, was, there was a sense of loss uh, there for me. Um, but when I saw him with my dad, my dad is like a classic Asian dad, classic immigrant dad. He was like, 
oh, look at, yeah, yeah, he looks so fat and healthy and he has such good appetite. And I was like, damn, like there's such a interesting intergenerational gap in between how we approach grief. And that kind of laid the seed for something that I wanted to explore later. Um, during the pandemic, when you know a lot of us felt isolated from our families, and also when we saw a, a rise in anti-Asian violence, um, I really wanted to create a series that would make a space where our elderly and our family members would feel safe. Um, you'll see it in the series, but it's almost like passing a mic between each of the family members, like uh, Henry's son and Loretta daughter and dad and mom as well, Gordon and, uh, and Diana. And I just wanted to um, make that space because as we all know, um, our parents don't share everything with their kids. Sometimes they try to protect us from those things, especially immigrant parents. Um, but the funniest thing is we as kids, we see through our parents so easily. We know them so well, right? Um, and I just wanted to, um, I, I wanted everyone to feel safe and heard um, through this series. Um, certainly, certainly did. You did touch um, this Caribbean immigrant <laughs> woman's heart with that as well. Um, I want to go into, because I think like this panel is really about um, the new world of creating content for digital platforms and new models for doing so as well, um, because I could spend the entire time gushing about the project itself um, and making Christopher feel very embarrassed up here. Um, but I won't do that to him today. I'll spare you. Um, so we'd just like to talk about um, the model for it, because on one hand, um, it can be termed a web series as default, um, as a digital series, but I also know that the project will take many different forms. So I just want to talk about that decision making, but to start out, did it, when you started with it, did you think that this would be a series and not a feature film? Because it could flow in that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start it off and then I'll yeah. pass on to Sean. But, um, I think that, you know, for a lot of racialized filmmakers, we're kind of given the lowest amount of budget. You know, the film industry is extremely risk averse. Um, and, you know, for me, this was my first feature length project. So I was an untested talent. And uh, sometimes people with money are like, oh, I don't know if he has what it takes. Right. Um, but the thing about, you know, a lot of racialized filmmakers understand this, you know, we're going to show up and we're going to we're gonna kill it, like we're gonna do a great job. And I think we did a great job. I'm, I'm extremely proud. Um, you know, people will be quick to say, it's, oh, it's a web series. No, this is a series. Like, I show ran the shit out of this shit. Um, <laughs> uh, Jane was like number one led a series. Yes. Liam Le was a lead in a series. And Lauren produced it, Sean produced it, Alan shot it immaculately. Um, and I think that, I mean, partially also we have to um, learn how to take up that space and learn how to be, you know, um, we have to, we have to ex acknowledge the work that we've done. Um, and I'm extremely proud of our team. It, it took a village. It definitely took a village. But, uh, yes. Yeah, so, I, I mean, just to speak about the origin, so... Um, uh, we just we we found out about Chris through playback tend to watch. Um, uh, his his name had popped up on my uh, as I was reading the trades in the morning, and um, Simone, who's here, uh, was our our coordinator at Faye Pictures, and I sent her a message and I said, um, Hey, there's this guy Chris. Um, we should I don't know track him down and, and find him and and meet with him and I don't know talk to him about what he's got going on. And um, and so, as resourceful as she was, she found uh, his contacts and got in touch, and and he met with uh, Simone and with our director of development Abdul, and talked about um, his project Fishboy, but also talked about streams as the sort of idea. And um, we had sort of uh, we had just done a round of uh, development with IPF for uh, another series, and um, we were looking for something else. And so Abdul was like, "What if this was a web series?" And Chris was like, "Okay, let's play ball." 
Um, and we started sort of put together the, you know, the, the pieces. And as I was putting, putting these pieces together, I was like, this isn't a web series. This isn't like, you know, in the sense of like what we've traditionally seen, you know, it, uh, this sort of not single, sometimes single location, sort of like comedy, you know, with sort of like a very low budget aesthetic. And I was like, this is very much premium. Um, and uh, and I was I was scared that we wouldn't get the funding, so I, I called up uh, IPF and I like about a week before the application, being like, "All right, listen, this is what we're coming in with. We have this not weird, but um, it's not your traditional web series, and it's a, it's very much like an art house drama, is how I described it." And she was like, um, "Okay, well, you know, we're genre agnostic. We want to focus on building filmmakers, and and we think you should submit that." Um, and so we did. And we got the funding for the development. We developed it with Chris, and Chris did a fantastic job developing it with Abdul. Um, you know, and it re you know I think uh, credit to to BIPOC TV and film for you know giving Chris the opportunity to do the BIPOC TV and film um, show in a boot camp, and and so he he knew what he was doing, and you know through his writers room experience, like it it it, it, it wasn't we didn't we didn't feel like we were training somebody. We felt like we were just like working with someone who was a bit of a pro. Um, and then, and then, and then we finished developing it. We're like, great, we've developed this amazing premium drama web series. Who's gonna put it on their on their screen? Mm -hmm. You know, it like, is there a YouTube channel that we would put this on? Like, do we put this on a YouTube channel? And I'd met with um, Jackie over at Super Channel, and you know, she described what they were doing, and and you know, it's it's no mystery. Super Channel's gone bankrupt like seven times in the last ten years. So like. I was a bit scared, um, but she was like, yeah, we're trying to really get away from that whole bankruptcy thing. So we want to be more, um, you know, we want to be more cautious about how we're spending our money. We want to be more strategic about it. Um, and so I said, okay, well, this, is, this isn't this is going to be that expensive for you. Um, and so Chris and I jumped on a call with her and we said, listen, we got this Bell Fund application. By the way, on Monday's the next Bell Fund application. So it was, taking notes, um, we had this Bell Fund application coming in that, the week after, and we didn't have a market partner, so we, couldn't, we weren't technically eligible, and, and we pitched it to her, and we said, this is what it is, this is what the world, all this kind of stuff, and, and, and she didn't read anything. She didn't read the Bible, she didn't read the scripts. We sent it to her after the fact, but she was like, yeah, this sounds good, and I'll, I'll write you the letter, and, and boom, we got the Bell Fund funding, and off we were off the races because we had to shoot this thing before the snow melted. <laughs> oh, um, oh my gosh, you touched on many of what would have been my follow-up question, Sean. <laughs> um, I think, I just hope some of you took that note there, nominate people for Playback 10 to watch. They may get discovered or you may get discovered in that way. So I hope to see so many more people submitting something for that um, when it comes up again. Um, and yeah, like that's what that's what I noticed with it because I saw in all of the write up for the film, like web series wasn't anywhere in that. And we know that from what both of you just said in terms of where the funding is and um, black and racialized people tend to go where the limited funding is available for us, you know. But look at what we're able to make from that. And it doesn't mean keep us at those budget levels. That's Please, not. No, 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 if no, there no, are any no. funders in the room, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Don't keep us down at those funding levels. But I think it just draws to the creativity um, within, within our communities, um, the ways in which we are able to just go for it. But what I also heard from what Sean said is the power the, trans, the transformative power of taking a chance on people, mm. of taking a risk. So I hope that that's one of the lessons coming out of here today. Um, oh my gosh, Sean took all my questions, man. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and anyway, that means that there's gonna be more times for questions from you. So uh, get I did, ready. I did wanna do a bit of a follow-up. Um, Warren P. Sonoda, who's a legend, um, director of the DGC, he actually nominated me for Playback 10 to watch, so I owe basically my career to him. So thank you, Lauren. Oh, stop. <laughs> there he is. Look at the most humble man in Canada. Yeah. And, and he wrote a letter of support for, for our Bell Fund application, right? Or no? Um, 
Not that one. No. Other okay. Letters of support. Okay. 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 So many letters. This guy got okay. three, three letters of support. Oh, we need the mic. Um, so we were putting together our application and there's like a little section at the end. It's like asterisk, like if you've got letters of support, submit them. And it's not like mandatory. So, you know, our last application, we got a location to give us a letter of support because we're like, oh, we'll sh maybe we'll shoot this location. And in that section was like a letter of support. And I think Chris clocked it and was like, letter of support. And he went out to like three different people, like well-established executives or writers and was like, I need to, and, these letters were like, it was like it was. They were passionate, and I think that was what pushed us over the, over the hump for sure. I think it was very important that we got those letters. So, you know, mentorship, sharing it, putting it forward. You know, um, taking that extra time. So when people come to me for letters of support, I, Warner Brothers Discovery, I got like seven letters of support I had to write. Um, you know knock on the door and ask. And, 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 and when you're in a position uh, where you can write one, you should do it, if, if you believe in the person, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Oh my God, I feel so good about that. Um, but my next, just also wanted to talk to Shant again, because this goes back to the whole series question. And this, this is also the first series for Fate Pictures. That's right, yeah. Um, and, so for a while you're doing feature films, you're doing that work here in Canada. So what led to that decision in terms of the expansion of your slate? Well, the the key the key thing, and, and this this may be actually this it's quite a novel thing in the Canadian screen sector, is when we started building fake pictures, yes, we're decolonized Hollywood, yes, we're queer trans, BIPOC, all that kind of stuff. But we are also we love film and we love TV. And we set out to produce what we wanted to see on screen. So that sort of, you know, we we tried our hand at procedurals and we tried our hand at maybe doing something in kids and it was just like, we're not watching it. And so we just didn't have enough passion to, to take it the full mile. But with, you know, our we every Monday morning, uh, every Monday meeting, we're, we're at the end of the meeting, after we go through the whole agenda, we talk about what have we watched last week, you know, or what have we read? And sometimes that's MILF Manor. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes that's... What? Yeah. That's not, not Lindsay show. We'll talk about that. No, no, it's, 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 it's pop, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's sort of like turn off your brain TV, right? It's like, it's, 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 but that's the thing is like, it, the key thing is, is if we are in our own bubble of funding and funding applications and CBC wants this and Bell wants this and all that kind of stuff, we're not paying attention to what audiences want. That was the key thing for why we do that every Monday is we just want to keep clocking. We want to keep refining our taste and, and keep building towards that because if we're gonna produce what we wanna see on screen, we need to be watching stuff. And the key thing was that we were watching series. And so while we loved film, we, we love going to TIFF, we love going to festivals, we love making films, we love watching films and art house films especially, we also love TV, but not procedural TV, which I'm sure there's an audience for that. You know, I, I would assume so, CBC keeps financing them. Um, <laughs> You know, but but we didn't. We don't watch that. We're not watching procedural. So why are we? Why would we do? Why would we bring that to CBC? And so we constantly kept pitching. You know, we kept looking to produce premium drama. That and so when streams came along, it made total sense because that was our taste. Um, did I answer your question? I think I went into a bit, well, bit kind, of milk manor of. tangent and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm still stuck on milk <laughs> manor. I have to go Google that afterwards. I'm so I'm sold. Okay, I'm, I'm in from the title alone. Um, I'm basically Jackie. <laughs> yeah. um, but did I answer your question? Sorry. I, I think so. Okay. We'll, we'll get back to it afterwards sometime. <laughs> um, so I, what's beautiful for me is just seeing this level of content on Canadian platforms. Like, because we know we're in an age of prestige, prestige TV. Like, who here has not watched season four of Succession yet. Okay, you're the only people I like inside here. We could <laughs> form our club afterwards. But we're watching those shows, we're watching, uh, watching Succession, we have all of these shows that we, White, White Lotus, you know, um, that this is the age, so I love to see that um, 
see that on Canadian TV right now. And I want to talk to both um, to the stars of streams now. Um, just talking to you about what it's like being the stars, leads, <laughs> leads of such an amazing series and what drew you to this project? Do you want to start, Jane? You're the biggest star. You've got the mic. Okay. Um, I think what, what was so exciting, and, and I mean, even talking now, a story like this, I mean, it's, it's one, it's rare that it comes along um, and came along so early in my career, but, and talking about it now, I think it's, this has existed, you know, years before an actor comes along. You know, it's a story that is years in the making, uh, is years of fighting for it, for funding, for, for the space. Um, and so I think there's a huge responsibility as an actor when you come to a project, especially a project like this. Um, and when Chris and I first met, we, he put me through a, like a very rigorous audition process <laughs> um, and kept me waiting for a really long time. But when we, when we did meet, uh, we shared very similar personal stories. Um, and, and, and for Henry, I think it's, it's coming into it and knowing that um, it's my, our responsibility to honor a story like that. Um, honor the work that has come before us to bring it to a place where they're casting it. Um, and I think, I mean, even even look at size, things I'm auditioning for now, it's it's just this was such a next level script. It, it felt, I think, I, I don't know if other actors feel this way, but there are projects that, you know, you can you can read a script and it just sits very easily. And, and that means, you know, whether you memorize it very easily or whatever. Um, because I did like a, like a British <laughs> like audition and I was like, nobody speaks like this. Um, <laughs> but I opened Chris's script and I was like, this is real life, this is my life. Um, there's so much of me in it. Um, it's such a vulnerable story. And, and I think just that, that immediately drew me in to, to be able to share a part of who I am to, to to honor Chris's vision for the project. And, and the team that we put together was so special, I think, coming on set. And um, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but we had a majority East Asian crew, um, East Asian cast, obviously, um, majority as well. And, and it was such a special space that was created for us, was gifted to us by production, by, by Chris, and, and who was obviously very intentional about the team that he put together. Um, and so a, a product like this doesn't come just out like that, you know? It, it, it's, it, and, and performance-wise, I think, you know, you can be the best actor in the world, but the, the, the people around you and, and, and the space that you're given and are gifted um, really affords you that opportunity to be your best self on set, and we had that. Um, there was no need to kind of explain or justify any part of it because everyone, on set knew that we were making something really special. Um, Gotta follow yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. Well, f well Jane, you're gonna, so Jane, to you're gonna else. do fine. I think that um, for you, this, this being such a moment for you in your career, you know, first time, you know, leading the call sheet um, for that, but... Um, and Something. and she oh that performance was so was so beautiful so profound um so yeah passing the mic to you now wow okay thank you so much for that um yeah i remember uh re uh when i auditioned and i remember chris also said do you want like my agent sent me the rest of the scripts i thought oh this is not usual usually i just i just get the sides and so i read the whole thing I thought, wow. Um, so I saw myself in there, my mother in there, my father, like I saw all my family members. Um, and the great thing about being an actor at times is that you can switch your POV around so that you can see through those people's eyes. And so I felt that I could, uh, so my father actually just, he did pass away like, like seven months before. So I thought this project 
was perfect for me to do because I thought I have all these emotions and fresh experiences that I can lend. And as an artist, as an actor, I am so lucky that I can express my whatever, my grief, my stories, whatever, th in this way. Um, your original question was about being a star, and uh, I just thought, I, I didn't think of it that way, because all I got were the sides the first day, and then after I read that, I said, yeah, there's a lot that uh, Diana does. <laughs> She's got a lot to do. Um, but um, I, I just felt that working with Chris uh, was so easy. I don't usually get this kind of uh, ease or this kind of um, a feeling of safety in being able to approach a director and say, I was wondering about this, what do you think? And every time I went to Chris, not just me, but any all the other actors, I think, I'll just speak for myself, <laughs> I, would, I would ask Chris, like, in, what do you think of this? And he would listen and he would nod, he goes, let's try it. I can't tell you how many times that has never, like, that happened so rarely when I'm working uh, in uh, a bigger budget production, I don't get afforded that luxury. They'll just, no, 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 we already figured it out. It's like, okay. So they're not even willing. Even when I got, I, I did a fairly big role. I was number four on the cast list. Uh, so I really moved up on this one. Um, but uh, yeah, they still were like, mm, okay, just, uh, I, I wasn't really afforded that luxury of being able to collaborate which I think is what we should be able to do uh, on, a, on a production. Yes, I'm an actor, but, and you're the director, uh, and the, all the other people are part of the team, but I thought we really all collaborated on, on the set. Because I wasn't always sure. I, I had a vision sometimes, and I'd say, do we share that vision, Chris? And then he'd say, yeah, let's go for it. And uh, that made all the difference in the world. But uh, yeah, seeing my name as on the call sheet as number one, I, I, I remember one morning, I, it was just in the middle of it, I just thought, I'm, I'm number one on the call sheet. <laughs> oh my God. <gasps> like on a production this size, that was, oh, that was just really, really something. And I don't take it for granted. And um, that moment uh, is an accumulation of all the other you know, shoulders that I've had to stand on, not just other actors, but my family and um, uh, all my ancestors, and just um, to be able to get to this point where I can proudly be number one on this project. So. Here, thank you. I'm going to collect myself. Um, okay. I just hope everybody's hearing what I'm hearing is um, when collaboration is centered, when humans are centered in the work that we're doing, when we set out to be transformative or when we it just comes naturally to us what could happen and how it impacts not only the art that we create but how people are affected by it, even the people who are part of the creation of the piece of art. So um, yeah, okay, I've collected myself. I've done it. Um, there is a scene <laughs> in it that, oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. Um, and I was just like, how? Like it was the intimacy that was captured um, on it. So that brings us to the brilliance of the DP, Alan. <laughs> That brings us to it, like um, Liam, we spoke about this before, you know, um, how, yes, there's chemistry between the actors based on the script, um, the culture of the set and everything, but also um, the amazing cinematography and the person behind it too. So, and I don't wanna spoil it for anybody, but there is a scene that is so beautiful. You will know it when you see it. You will hear my voice in your head. This is what Kadon was talking about. Um, you could describe it a little bit. Give I us a little hint. It's, we got, we got 82 minutes, there, there, guys. Don't worry about it. There are two people in a car. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's what it, 
there are two people in a car and I just thought that it was so beautiful and it's such a tight space. And then I heard that you uh, that that was actually a miracle of a scene that was shot in 30 minutes. So yeah. how? <laughs> um, well, you know, I guess zooming out a little bit, like it was a mini series with many episodes, right? And we shot it like a feature because we couldn't break it up by episode. So uh, the production team did a great job planning out all the scenes we were to shoot. And as I'm sure many filmmakers in the audience know, sometimes things get you know, busy on set and you kind of have to push things to the back burner. So I think um, Liam and Brett, who I think is here today, who's in the scene, there he is. Um, they, were, they were waiting around to do this scene and it's the scene in the car, it's at nighttime. Um, and it's a very, really important scene for these characters to, to connect and the audience finally gets to understand a little bit more about who these people are and what made them what they are. Um, and so uh, it just happened to be the last scene of the day and we were busy and yeah, we were just like, had only 30 minutes left to shoot the scene, this is what happened. Um, and Lauren was like watching over us that day and like looking at the watch and it's like, I don't know how you guys are gonna do this. But, and then Chris is like, we got it. And so I don't worry, we got it, you know? <laughs> and so uh, we had everything prepared and we just jumped in the car. I think it was uh, Chris, myself, um, and Liam yeah, and Brett. Our, uh, sound person. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. And it was just five of us in this van and it was chaos, everyone's running around, like clear that background, do this. But you know, I think the great thing about the set culture is that everybody was chaotically moving, but no one was freaking out. You know, it was like a very safe and healthy environment because at that point when we were all finally in the car, it's like, okay, Chris is like, we're gonna roll now. Even our AD wasn't in the car, so no one, could, she couldn't even hear what was going on, right? And we just kind of took a breath, I remember, because like, okay, guys, everyone breathe, how are you guys doing? And we hadn't even said hi Brett pro to Brett properly. <laughs> and then he's just there and it's like, we're gonna roll now, you know? And so we just took our time to, to shoot Brett's coverage and we just rolled the camera and we didn't cut, thankfully to digital in this, in this situation. Um, and we just went through it and Chris took his time. And I, I hope, and I, I think I try to prioritize like making sure the actors have a safe place to, to perform, right? And to do their craft and to bear their soul for, for, for us, you know? Um, and so we just took our time, like, I think 10 minutes to do breath side. We did many, many takes. And it was like, we got it. Let's turn around, we did 10 minutes on Liam. And then we did a quick little insert. And then after we finished, Chris is like, that's it, we did it. And then we opened the sliding door of this van. Chris is like, we got it. And Lauren's like, yes, <laughs> three minutes to spare. Wait, wait, yes, Lauren. So what time was hard wrap and what time did we wrap? Um, hard wrap was 11. Chris opened that door at 10.59. So, oh, wow. yeah. Oh, why? Oh. And, and my exact words after opening up the van and right in the face of our first AD, Philomena, who's lovely, I was like, let's go! <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. Are you, are you done? <laughs> are you done? Okay, good. You Do you need a moment now? <laughs> um, just want to talk, because for something like that to happen, you know, there has to be a lot of trust, you know, um, between director, well, of course, the actors and everybody, but I want to just go into your meet cute origin story, you know, um, and how your, your relationship was born out of um, community mm. and coming together in times of grief, in times of trauma, mm. too. So... Um, let's talk about how you met. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go like halfway and then you can. So this is, this is the story of how I met Alan Liu, um, my twin flame, DP and director. Um, so uh, it starts off kind of, you know, in a deep place, but, um, you know, last two years ago when the height of the anti-Asian racism and there are lots of uh, shootings going on. So the Atlanta shooting had just happened with the uh, killing of the Korean spa workers. Um, and I was, uh, you know, Asian folks in the industry and also Asian folks in general were just looking for places to grieve and talk because this is this kind of stuff had never happened to our community before. Um, and very graciously, BIPOC TV and film allowed us to have self-care Sundays and for like a virtual space because this was still during the pandemic where we could just come together on Zoom and share our feelings. Um, so I was helping moderate the second uh, self-care 
And then, um, yeah, everyone was turning on their cameras, and this kind of weird-looking guy shows up on the Zoom, uh, sitting beside his wife. I was like, oh, who is this guy? Um, but then, yeah, we started, you know, passing the virtual mic around, and everyone started sharing their thoughts and feelings, and uh, yeah, you can take it from here. Yeah, I think it was an important um, event to go to, and I think thanks to my wife for encouraging me to go to, and I think it was, because not really filmmaking um, specific. It was just about, hey, let's create a space for anyone to come. You guys are probably all going through similar things, and let's just, let's just hear each other, right? And so Chris was moderating, and that was, it was, it was really great to see, because as I'm sure many of who have met Chris, and soon will meet Chris, and I can even just judge right now, Chris is such, such, has such a calming presence, right? And um, was able to create space for people to share their grief. Um, he didn't pressure anybody. He didn't rush anybody. I even remember uh, the time was up on the panel, and someone's like, "Oh, do I have do I have time to do it? I don't want to take up time." And he, Chris is like, "No, whoever needs time will have their time." You know, and I was like, "Dang, like this guy, like it must be like, no, sorry, that's all we have time for." But he really just stayed on as long as he as long as people needed to. And I think that's evident in how he made space for Jane and for Liam and all the actors to have their space, right? Um, and so I just was really drawn to the way he carried himself as a person. Directing aside, filmmaker aside, I didn't even see him as that. He was just the moderator. And so um, after that panel, we both kind of simultaneously, I think we're kind of like, oh, he's a director. Oh, he's a cinematographer. Like, maybe there's some, the, let me find out about this guy, you know? So I did a little research, played back time to watch, all this stuff, as I'm sure Sean did. So it was like, um, a good opportunity to reach out, and and he Chris reached out to me, and so we kind of connected, and we had a couple of Zoom calls and talks, and just like everyone has been shared, it was very evident that we had a similar um, thought process, a similar lived experience, and we just I, we just clicked, identified with the, one another, um, and so the conversation quickly evolved to, hey, what kind of what kind of stories are you interested in telling? What what kind of work are you interested in creating? You know. And um, I was in a point in my life where like, well, I'm like very focusing on my, my DP career and I want to focus on like dramas and family dramas. And Chris is like, huh. noted, you know? <laughs> and I think you know, a few months went by and we kind of just stayed connected. But that was around the point where they, um, Chris was working with Shant and Faye to develop the, the promotional IPF trailer for streams. And so it was just good timing and Chris is like, check this out. And he, he uh, Malachi, who was our producer on that, um, he sent me uh, the script and um, the breakdown for the promo, which you guys have not seen. It's a different thing that we shot, um, but it was a nice proof of concept, and that was what we first collaborated on. And we, you know, talked about what movies we liked and what were our influences, and we kind of just all started pouring in our our creative energies into that. But like you said, it started out as the community, and through Pipe TV and Film, you know. So. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to sing Alan's praises okay, for a little bit. This is a bromance that will last the ages. So Alan is an extremely humble and lovely man. Um, he moved from L.A. to pursue his DP career. Um, but the thing is, I'm not even close to the most prolific director that this man has worked with. Alan has, wor has been in a room, and he gaffed for 10 or so years in a place called Hollywood. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> When Alan has been in a room with this guy, this young up-and-coming guy, Steven Spielberg. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he's, he's worked on small films such as Black Panther. I don't know. Anyways, Alan will never tell you this in person because he's just a humble... But when we got onto set and Alan was doing the things he was doing, I took it for granted. I was like, oh, great. Like, uh, not only was he leading with kindness and warmth, like a lot of male DPs I've seen on set are very like barking orders and like a lot of the film industry is very military and very like, you know, gruff. Alan does not do that. He's very kind. He listens. He invests in the story. <sighs> you can work with him, but like, please don't work with him when I want to work with him. <laughs> um, but, you know, not only that, but like this man is made of... I've been on set with him where he hasn't peed in fucking 14 hours. <laughs> like, it's like, he's a machine. And like, the, the way that he was holding the handicap and stuff, I was like, oh, I guess everyone can do that. And then every gaffer afterwards is like, this guy's kind of crazy. And then I was like, oh, Alan's kind of crazy, like in a good way, so. Crazy, I'm crazy, yeah. no, 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 anyway, sorry, no. sorry. No, it's okay, I, 
I love. I agree man. with that. He's you know, like, like Alan did a phenomenal job with this with this project, and now I'm gonna go through your IMDb. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna go through it. I'm gonna look through, and I'm gonna send you random emails. You know, just screaming your name, just your name. This says Alan with an with with an exclamation after it. Yeah, That's yeah, it. Yeah. You're gonna start receiving emails like that for me. Um, but it's so beautiful. There are other things about the project that I just thought was amazing. All the archival footage throughout it, um, all the other scenes in it. I just think that you also, like there was so much warmth in it as well in supposedly Alberta. So imagine seeing warmth in a project where outside just looks gray and cold and very anti-Caribbean. So like, <laughs> actively anti you know, actively anti-Caribbean, you know, and seeing that, um, but it was chef's kiss. So thank you so much for that. Um, and then it's just like, I've heard really great things about the set culture and I'm sure like based on what everybody has said, shared here today, you know, you're like, well, how did they do that? The last set I was on was abusive as hell, you know? <laughs> how did they make that possible? You know, I wake up some mornings and be like, ugh, I have to go see these people again. Um, so let's talk to the wonderful Lauren about how she made people feel excited to come out each day. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it was a, a, a team process. Like, it's just not producers that create that environment. Like, I, I think everybody that was on the set was really passionate about the story and really wanted to be there. And um, it, it, sh it showed in the work. Like, this, this project wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for our amazing cast and crew. And I, the hiring process, uh, you know, I talked to Chris and... It was my first time ever production managing anything. And, you know, I, I went to Chris and I was like, I, I'm new at this and I, I hope I do okay. And, you know, that was like one of our first conversations. And, and he's like, no, I, I want more of that on the set. I was like, oh, okay. Um, so then we started kind of having this conversation about, you know, you know, with this series, like, can this be the opportunity for somebody who's been, you know, a, a PD on a bunch of short films to, to move into, you know, longer form content? And, um, you know, Chris had worked with uh, Lucy Wong, who was our um, costume designer on the teaser, and she had just done a bunch of kind of short form things. And Chris was like, I think we should call her in for an interview and, and you know, let's, let's have a conversation. And the interview went great. And, you know, we brought her on set. And, the, like, she did 81 costumes in a basement of, like, a grungy Airbnb in Hamilton, you know? And it was just, like, really amazing to see, you know, people so excited to kind of have that opportunity to, to take that step up in their, in their career. Um, yeah, I, that was kind of, like, the hiring process. And, and I think just, as, as I said, like, everybody was really excited to be there. And so it just created this, like, really awesome environment. And, you know, it was around the time that Everything Everywhere All at Once had just, just come out. And our production designer, Meryl, with um, Lucy, uh, they, they brought these little googly eyes. And so, you know, it'd be, like, a very serious scene happening. And then you'd, le you'd leave set and you'd be like, why do I have seven googly eyes on my back? <laughs> like, what is going on? Um, so yeah, that's, that was kind of the process. Can I, can I add a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, firstly, to, to, to Lauren's credit, um, yeah, th this was uh, Lindsay. So Lindsay's my RVP of production and, and we sort of threw you in the deep end a little bit. Um, I, was, I was on the circuit with Framing Agnes, our, our film that uh, was premiering last year. And, um, Lindsay was um, uh, shooting a commercial out in Alberta, actually, funny enough. Um, and we shot this in Hamilton. And, and yeah, and, and you know, it was, it was just like, and I had to, and I came in and, and had to, to coach through it a little bit. But I think, you know, the key thing was the, the synergy between our, our ethos as, as a company, but also with Chris. Like, Alan says Chris, like, gave us all this time. Chris came ahead of schedule on basically 14 of the 15 days we shot. Like that's huge, that's massive. Um, you usually going over time, you know, and, and so, you know, it, it spoke to, to his precision, it spoke to, to our diligence. I think the crew saw um, Lauren just working her butt off um, 
to 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 give them a good experience and you know it was it was ragtag but it, it but it but it worked and, and everyone sort of came together and oh my god lucy lucy and stephanie right yes. yeah. yeah lucy and stephanie running from their van in i was just because i was always in the house they would just like run in go downstairs into the grungy basement pick up the and they just loved it because everyone loved the story and i think that's really a key thing about crewing this was we brought in people who are not just excellent technicians, um, but they were they believed in, in what we were making. I think that, that's key in terms of how we're... Yeah. Um, just to add something, I, I think it's always, in this industry, it's always good to just keep an open mind and always be open to learning. Um, shout out the Daniels, um, because I don't know if everybody here remembers, I'm sure you remember. First day on set, I'm sweating, because this is the biggest set I've ever stepped on. We have a line dance scene in a cowboy, in a country bar at the end of the week, and we don't have money for extras. So the first five minutes of meeting everybody, I take off my mask. I'm like, hey, I'm the director. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on streams, and we're excited to do this with you. I'm going to teach you a line dance because you're going to dance in the line dance as crew because we don't have money for extras. And that was the first thing that we did it as, as a team. And it's because I'd heard from Everything Everywhere and Jamie Lee Curtis and Leading in Stretches and the Dan Daniel Kwan and Daniel Sch Schubert as well. Um, but that was a great way to just break the ice, also set the tone for the crew. You know, like film is t film and TV are, are hard work, but you know, this isn't surgery. We're, we're here to have a good time. And um, yeah, we all came out of it knowing a bit of line dancing, so. <laughs> Um, so after this, we're gonna have a giveaway, and the prize will be a personal line dancing lesson <laughs> from Chris. So I forgot, please I forgot get ready. I don't know how we're gonna make the choice for the giveaway, but you know we may just do some kind of random competition. You know, so get ready. Do your, sh and you know what? You've already won. <laughs> You've already won it. Yeah, you know. Um, so now we're going to open it up to questions. We have, I made sure to leave enough time, I think so. So, yes, so I already see one. Yeah. Sure. Um, I just want to talk about production a little bit because I heard you say 15 days. Um, so maybe talk about how that all worked for you guys because that sounds like a very tight schedule. Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to repeat that so you all hear. So the question was about um, the days of production, 15 days, and how did you make it possible in such a tight schedule? My only answer is, yes, indeed, it was 15 days. <laughs> it was a glorious 15 days. Um, and uh, so we, you know, adding to the, to the point about um, the crew being passionate, one of the key um, uh, goals, or, or, or rather um, key ethics, just tenements of, of how we operate is, is we want to make sure everyone from, from the director down to the PA, and I don't want to say down, but director to the PA um, are feeling comfortable, are, are, you know, have their needs met. Um, and uh, so, for example, like our production coordinator had a family emergency and immediate, and we, you know, we were down a driver basically because we had only a certain limited number of people who had driver's licenses. Um, and, and immediately I was like, no, 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 you can't stay. You have to go, go do your family thing and, and we'll figure it out. And, you know, um, that meant me staying out in the cold for an hour waiting for someone to pick me up and, and take me back because we ran out of uh, seats and ran out of uh, drivers. Um, but we did 15 days and it was three weeks and we gave everyone Saturday and Sunday off and uh, we made it 11 plus one days um, because we, we could not afford budgetarily burnout. It's more expensive to have a disgruntled crew, it's more expensive to have a crew that is militaristically being thrown around. That's why Disney does it, is because they have money to throw at you. Say, oh, you're, we're going into overtime? Here's some more money. Be quiet. We didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not to say if we got, got more money, we were going to do that. But, you know, 
it was like we can't aff- we, we, ju- we just knew we couldn't afford to do that and I, and I know you know even in low budget situations that does happen but but because the key goal was longevity the key goal was 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 building a a, a sustainable production model um, that, that was a key thing um, yeah we just uh, uh, and then and then in terms of scheduling it that was Philomena um, so if you're looking for an AD and you're looking for someone good, Philomena uh, Grashki, Grashki, Grashki. Um, she took six episodes of content um, in three different time periods, four different time periods, and put it into this beautiful schedule. Minority Report. Like. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 I, and me being the producer I was, I was like, oh, like, Okay, Jane, you're, you're, I don't know if you're gonna like this or not, but maybe not. But I was like, Jane's coming in for one, uh, there was in the one line schedule, Jane was coming in for one scene. I'm like, okay, Jane's gonna come all the way from Toronto, all the way to Hamilton for one scene. Um, and I was like, oh, like, and, and it was like, a, a, like, and obviously we have to pay for the full day and everything like that. And I was like, no, let's just, let's just put that scene somewhere else. Like, just put it, put it in another day. And Philomena took me, like, called me and she was like, don't, mess with my schedule. <laughs> I, I know what I'm doing, and let me do my job. And I was like, all right. And it worked. It worked. It worked. <laughs> and now I know don't mess with Philomena's schedule. <laughs> so I think I only had one of those days where I had one scene. All the other days, <laughs> I had many, many scenes. So I was grateful to that one <laughs> where I could say, oh, I'm only doing this, okay, <laughs> then that's great. And uh, I, I, I had, because of the time periods, I had to switch wardrobes so many times. Oh my God, my hair had <laughs> to get sprayed and aged. And so I, I was grateful for that one day. So um, I was just gonna say most sets that I've been on, bigger production sets, it's always hurry up and wait. But this one, on this one, I felt like it was just hurry up. <laughs> so, but, but in a very productive and, and a very positive way. Thank you. Another one, right there. Great. I'll, I'll just repeat it for everyone else. So the question was about um, the process in terms of determining the look of the series. Um, before that, I just want to shout out Raymond. Hello, Raymond. Raymond's another actor in the series, and he's just so amazing in episode four. I just want to say that. Um, so uh, during the pandemic, uh, I was just watching a shit ton of Asian cinema because I wanted to see people like myself on screen. And that's when I had a love affair with Edward Yang and Taiwanese New Wave and Koreda and like very tender, soft Japanese family dramas. And after watching so many of those, um, I have, you can ask me later for a list of recs. Um, we decided, and, this, and on the tone of the story as well, we decided on something that was like slower paced. Um, and then Alan had the amazing idea of uh, coming up with the different aspect ratios to show the different eras that we're shooting in um, and accompanying color grades too. It looks gorgeous, like it's all there. Um, It looks even better in the series, Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. I will say to go with the 15 days, prep like hell. Like we prepped a lot. I think the, the amazing thing of being able to work with Alan and some of the team on the teaser is that basically we were starting prep nine months before, because we shot the teaser one day shoot, we had a sense of what we wanted to do, and then the next nine months we were sharing references and I was talking to people and watching stuff and we're also doing, uh, on top of that, we did the writer's room in January, we locked the scripts in late February, March we started prep, so it was a very quick, and then um, May we shot. So it was a very, very quick pipeline, Um, but it was just enough time um, and to catch the last snowfall in Canada um, to get the series going. Yeah. Um, I think, like Chris was saying, you know, the extra time was like invaluable. And like that's, that's a super big luxury that most people don't get, right? And um, because we did the promo, like I had sat with the story and the tone of it for a long time. And when I finally got the scripts, I'm like, yep, 
that tracks with what we're talking about and all the Edward Yang movies that he was like sending to me and um, just kind of educating me about some other cinema that I had not even actually seen myself. So um, it was a great kind of study period that we had. Um, and we really just kind of sat down and, and broke down like, what does this moment mean? What does this, this time period mean? Um, and um, it kind of grew from just those conversations very organically. Um, but, you know, I think with a lot of the developing a look of any project, right, it all comes from the page, it all comes from the script. And um, it really was a joy to read, like Jane was saying, right? It was like, you could sit through and read everything, but what I responded to was that there's these very distinct time periods and every character has their voice. And so it was important to find a visual language to um, attached to each character, attached to each time period, so that the audience would get the same experience reading the scripts um, as you would watching the series. Um, so yeah, we developed a couple of custom like LUTs to get technical. Um, so custom LUTs for each time period and uh, applied them for each of the different se sequences. Um, and yeah, just talk all those, so talk had, shop. We had graded dailies. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, and so that, that was the benefit, because I, I wasn't sure what the post process was going to be like, right? Because we know the, it's a series, and we don't know what the time frame is going to be. So uh, a good friend of mine who works as colorist, um, I'll shout him out. His name is Tashi True. Um, fun fact, he, he was a colorist on a, a small movie called Avatar 2. Uh, and I went to film school with him, and I sat next to my friend Tashi the first day of film school, and we're like, hey, dude, what's up? And he's now doing amazing things. But he was, he was gracious enough to create... Um, custom LUTs based on my notes. So I sent him like, hey, I want to do a bleach pad pass here. I want to do 50% of that. And then this one is a more uh, flash film look. And I want to do 30% of that. So I gave him a, a breakdown with references. And then we developed some LUTs for us based on some lens tests that we shot um, at White's. Shout out to William F. White's for giving us all this stuff. Um, and yeah, we, we took that footage, up, created custom LUTs to make the look. Um, and then we had graded dailies. And the post process was very smooth from there. So yeah. Yes, that's correct. So, uh, oh, can uh, I just repeat just so? Yes, yeah, for sure. Here. So the question was about your finance plan for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll just I'll just put all the cards on the table. Um, so yeah, so IPF only funds product, only funds first season of production uh, after you've got development finance through them. So that they only they don't do you can't come in if you haven't done development with them. And um, so we did the IPF CMF development packaging program. Uh, IPF comes in for 200, Belfund came in for 150, plus another 50 for marketing. Um, Ontario Crates came in last minute for 225, like more than anybody else. And it was just sort of like, it saved us. We didn't have to reinvest our fees, amazing. Um, and then the rest was uh, tax credits and Super Channel came in for $25,000. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Woo -woo! <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I, I think this is a question for uh, Faye Pictures, but um, the series is doing really well um, and has gotten quite a bit of international attention. Like Variety's written about it and it's gone to the Cannes series. Um, but uh, I, I was curious, like, how much of that was was that like kind of like an intentional strategy, or was that like did that just all kind of happen accidentally? No, if Hold we look at sorry, wait. there are people in the back, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Um, so the question is about the marketing for it, because yes, I have noticed that, but I also know how Shant moves. I'm like, I call him Mr. Mogul, who's like building this like empire studio type of thing, you know? Um, so yeah, so the question is about the marketing and if some of the things that we're seeing now, if that was already in the plans for the series. Yes, yeah, so... Um, so while it may be something that you find, uh, and I found personally, um, uh, just extraneous and tedious, it is uh, Bell Fund requires you to put together an audience development plan. And I was just like rolling my eyes. I'm like, audience development plan, what does that mean? Um, and because we came from the film world and because you know there's the top five uh, festivals, Venice, Toronto, um, Sundance, Berlin, uh, Cannes, and that's how you get a platform for your feature film. 
um, I was like, what is the equivalent of that for series? And um, if you go to the Telefilm International Promotion Program, they tell you exactly. Um, and it's, uh, it's Sundance Episodic, it's Berlin Series, it's Series Mania, and it's Cannes Series. Um, so um, I knew we were gonna submit to those four at, at least, and that was in our audience development plan from a funding standpoint. Um, uh, throughout the process of building Fay Pictures and building these projects and working with other collaborators, you know, I, I five years, six years ago, I, I, I production managed a film called Porcupine Lake that premiered at TIFF, and and with Ingrid Benninger, and and, and Ingrid was so generous, um, you know, and and I, it inspired a lot in me. One of the things she inspired was this sort of family ethic in terms of building a team, in terms of building a crew, but also in terms of being inventive and being being a producer and, and running things. Because if you have a small budget, you gotta run your own show. You can't wait for someone. If we, we love Super Channel, we love them, but if we just p let them do their thing, it wouldn't have had the impacts that it would, right? We had to put a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of money so you know, getting the fifty thousand from Bell Fund just for audience development, um, going to Ontario Creates for twenty thousand um, in just marketing is meaningful. So if there's any funders here, marketing funds are few and far between, and they're necessary for audiences to be able to see content. Um, we can't just spend money producing it. We need to spend money marketing it as well, so that people can see it. Um, so it was, you know. We, but yeah, it's hiring a publicist and, and saying, I want a variety piece, and, and then them saying, great, we'll do it, you know? Good. Um, yes, we have a question up there. Thank you for that. And I purposefully left out a question about the writer's room because I wanted somebody to ask that. So thank you. <laughs> you you're now in the running for the free line dancing <laughs> lessons. Um, so yes, let's talk about that. And I'm going to do some like shameless promotion here. Like Christopher, <laughs> Christopher um, participated in our show and our boot camp um, two years ago. That was led by Anthony Q. Farrell. Um, so yeah, like this was, I think that it really was kismet in terms of how everything just fell together for that. But I also knew, I also know how intentional you were about building your room and how you also wanted to use it as, use it in a way to present opportunities to people who are often overlooked. So go ahead. Great question. I think, um, uh, we have the distinct honor of being the first all Asian writers room in Canada, potentially the States too, who knows? Um, I think that uh, we just wanted to create a space, like the writers room is truly a sacred space. Um, you're getting folks sharing about their personal history and it's in particular for the subject matter of the series, we're gonna have people bear their souls a little bit. Um, so we wanted to ha invite people into the room from shared experience. Um, so not just the East Asian folks, but you, we have Mariska. Is Mariska still here? Yeah, yeah, one of our writers is still here. Mariska Almeida, who's amazing. Um, um, and uh, it was just, it was, um, it was really special. I think like I've been also in writer's rooms. Um, I've been the only Asian person. I've been the only BIPOC person. And it was so nice to be able to... Um, it was truly like a lot of writers' rooms. It was like group therapy to be able to talk about our families, talk about our parents openly. Um, we didn't have to explain anything. It was just like, oh, your mom does that thing too? Totally, same here. Um, and I think that um, uh, the, the best thing that I like to talk about is that many, many times in the last three plus years, we have heard the same thing over and over again. We wanted to invite racialized writers into the room. We couldn't find them all throughout Canada. How many submissions did we get? 120 plus. There's so many people. There's so many talented people. We could only take six in the room, but there's so many talented Asian writers, not just Asian, BIPOC, racialized writers in Canada. We just need the opportunities like this room. I really wish we could have had everybody. Um, but the quality, the caliber of writing, Leland Du, Leonard Chan, Marushka Almeida, 
Min Voan, who is our story coordinator. And of course, this funny guy who's laughing on his throne, Abdul Malik, story, ex executive story editor back in Alberta. Um, they did so well, and I'm so grateful. They 100%, like I steered the ship for sure, they enriched it. They made the story so much better, and I'm so grateful to have worked with them. Um, so we have time for one more question. Underhanded throw to you, Kadon, and um, you, Shot. Uh, I'm getting chatter that C11 is going to vote today, hopefully. What can we do uh, as BIPOC TV and film and Bay Pictures to ensure that Christopher gets 3.5 million per episode next time he goes out? So what's the next step? Because I think we do a really good job with emerging voices, but what happens to the mid career people? Do you want to? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Jason Carmen in the seat. Yeah, yeah, in the seats. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Watch Golden Delicious. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I've been very passionate about mid career professional development for years now, and I think that's been a missed opportunity for Canada. We do a great job of providing opportunities um, for people at the onset of their careers but then we abandon them shortly after. And we don't invest, um, we don't invest sufficiently in further development of our artists. Um, so I hope now with Bill C-11, with the new influx of money to the CMF with the budget announcement this, this, um, this week, um, CMF receiving $40 million over the next two years, specifically to go towards underrepresented voices um, and French language speaking um, content creators as well. Um, to see that I really hope that it is invested in people who have been putting in the work for a long time. And for it to not be, not to be piecemealed, I think we do a lot of that in terms of trying to give like little pockets of change to people, and then we still have to scrunch around to find it elsewhere, but I would love to see from our funders, from our decision maker, a greater commitment to um, people who are making their second feature film, who are working on series, um, who are creating opportunities to export Canadian talent, to build our reputation on an international stage. That, that is what I would like to see coming out next. And I think like, just before I hand it over to Shantu, I know has a lot to say about this. Um, I really, I've been thinking for years, you know, why is it such a default or so easy to just give money to the entry level? Or why is it thinking about investing in women investing in um, people outside of the gender binary? Why is it investing in people who are black or indigenous people of color that we always think that we have to start from the entry level, that it's because people don't have the skills, the knowledge to do the work and to excel in it. And I really question that bias and where it comes from as well. And there's a lot that we could unpack with that. I could spend an entire day unpacking that with people. Um, but it just goes to show like the assumptions that are made about us. Look at Christopher, look at Alan, you know, like with his experience, you know, what he would have access to in Canada. What Christopher, what Christopher has been working for years in this industry, you know, what are we doing to lift our talent to the next level so that we could have a star system in Canada? so that we could have more names on an international stage, so that when films go to the Oscars, we could see how, we could see more Canadian production companies and studios that invested in that project, instead of seeing that all of the projects are American-backed um, films only. So then we could see films like Turning Red winning Canadian Screen Awards as well. That's what I want to see that would happen next with us, and I think that's what Bill C-11 is going to do for our industry. Shot. Um, I think what's so frustrating for me is um, is Canada is a as we know and we say at the beginning of every every screening every presentation these days Canada is a colonized space. 
It's a colonized space where the commerce is continually moving towards a specific middle Canadian, middle American target audience that, you know, and in, in, in a legacy content space where all the broadcasters are playing their, you know, content on airwaves um, with commercials um, that, you know, in this format of Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., you know, Thursday nights at 7 p.m. kind of thing. Um, this tune-in television model, which we've really, as a, as a as a country, have abandoned, um, and I think you know, not rightfully so, but just sort of like it. It's been 15 years since people have started saying the word "golden age of television," and I've been waiting for it to see that in Canada. You know, I think really we have one key producer of golden age television, and that is Jennifer Kowaja at Sphere Media. Sort of the porter, mm -hmm. you know, even Cardinal um, and and Trickster, yeah. um, she oh. constantly is producing premium drama, and and you know I'm here trying to trying to make this premium drama happen, but you can't just have one. You have to have abundance of it, and so C11 opens that door to decolonizing the Canadian media landscape. It allows us to not be beholden to a 38 million. Canadian population, although we love our Canadians, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, we have a difficult identity, you know, we're like, we're adjacent to the Americans, we're watching American content, you know, from an economic standpoint, the government wants to constantly invest in Disney shows and blah, blah shows and all, you know, all these American shows and at the same time invest in Canadian stuff, but don't want to support amplifying it, putting that out into an international landscape. And suddenly when C11 opens that door, it says, well, the internet is something that is global. And you, a Chinese Canadian filmmaker, you and a South Asian Canadian filmmaker can, or you know, you a Caribbean Canadian filmmaker can now access that core audience, that base. And if we talk about base, Trump, uh, you know, but it's the, the, the. I look at that model. I look at that mo and I, you know, I look at it and I say, if you use this for good, you could build so much. Yeah. If you could build a base of people who believed in something, you know and they spread word of mouth and they talk to their friends and they talk and suddenly you have fans and supporters of your content who are talking about it and suddenly you know Canadians realize oh my god there's this show that all these you know people in 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 the Caribbean or all these people in China that are watching that is Canadian where can i find this you know we watch what the world is watching um, and and so we've been stifled by this broadcasting system that is focused on that 38 million Canadian population as opposed to thinking about the world as our oyster. Um, and I think C11 is going to, to bring up, I, I'm not gonna say it's gonna be utopia, yeah. but you know, I think it's gonna, it's gonna shift things in, in a way where what we, are, what we love watching, we then get to produce. Yeah, um, just wanna say on the last note on that is that the, the current Broadcasting Act is just slightly younger than I am, <laughs> okay? Canada looks so much, it looks so much more different now. You know, we know like us living in Toronto, like what the population actually looks like. So our content should reflect that. You know, the decisions being made on a policy level should reflect that and also allow us to dream up a new Canada. You know, so I think about the possibilities that it can bring to us. Um, and I, I love change and I want you all to just pay attention soon in the next in the next few months in terms of the writing of the policy directives for it to, you know, that's really where we could influence change in how things are funded, how things are greenlit, um, and who gets to shine in Canada as well. So it's a very optimistic time, and I know some of you who speak to me on a daily basis are like, who is this optimistic person in front of you right now? Why isn't she raging? Um, but um, I think that truly, you know, what it presents for us is change, and um, I'm glad to see people are open to change, but I really challenge people to think beyond competition with the U.S., 
but to think about what are we saying about ourselves as Canadians moving forward? What are we saying about who we are by what we allow to show on our screens, by what we share in the world about who Canada is, by how we reconcile, through how we reconcile with our past and the future that we're building towards. I think this gives Canada an opportunity to rewrite or to write a new narrative for itself. And I hope that we all participate in that as well. Okay, so it is, it is 3.20 and just like a West Indian, I disregarded time. <laughs> Um, but I'm so grateful to have this opportunity here today um, to speak with all of you, but also to platform this amazing series that I hope you all see, and I hope it inspires you with your next project or the project you're working on right now, see what is possible. So thank you so much to all of you wonderful people. Uh, um, Thank you to the Canadian Film Fest um, for taking my email when I just knew and be like, I have an idea for a panel. I don't know what you're doing for the festival this year, but this has to be in it. Um, thank you so much for, again, taking a chance in that way. Um, and thank you all for being here. I know there's gonna be a giveaway, you know. Okay, I don't know what the prize is, but I've thrown in the additional prize of Christopher teaching the winner how to line dance. Okay, so that's gonna happen now. And yeah, I just wanna thank again the panelists for joining us and thank you, Kate on of course, and thank you for showing up. I think it's so inspiring to just to hear about kind of the, what a wonderful set environment and I think the end product of uh, streams, the show really showcases, you know, the passion and all the work that you've all put into it. And if you want to learn more about how you can perhaps make your onset culture better for your own production, our next panel is actually aptly named Better Your Sets. And that will be at 345, so please stick around. Um, we're now going to perhaps shuttle you off, but before that, I also want to shout out our tomorrow. We have an in conversation with Jasmine Mosafari, moderated by the one and only War and Peace Sonoda. So definitely something that you don't want to miss out on. And yeah, watch our films, watch streams, and hope to see you all for our next panel at 345.